Um, hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, today, it is my great pleasure to introduce you uh, Simon uh, Hortsley. Uh, Simon is a Royal Society Tata uh, University Research Fellow, and uh, he is working in the Center for Metamaterials in Exeter. And uh, Simon will uh, speak about uh, revisiting topological materials so um, crystal optics and the chair number simon please thanks very much bogdan um okay uh th thanks for coming to this talk um the, th the thing i want to tell you about today is, is something that's been uh sort of bothered me for some time uh which is that um there's a lot of work on applying uh topology to try and predict things about materials uh what materials do to waves uh but I always find it difficult to connect those results with uh, things I already knew um, in, let's say, optics or, or, or acoustics. Uh, and this is my attempt to um, go back to the beginning and understand what the churn number, which is the topological invariant people use typically um, in, in this field, uh, what that, that thing tells us um, about the material in terms of um, crystal optics. So, so it says optics here. I know this is mostly an audience who, who does mechanics um, and acoustics, but but hopefully it will become clear that what, what I tell you applies to any wave. Um, right. So so what's what's the idea? If you're not familiar to familiar with this this sort of uh, field of topological wave physics, what, what's the sort of whole idea about? Well, um, topology is about it's it's a sort of set of tools that mathematicians have developed uh, for classifying different kinds of objects according to whether you can continuously deform them into each other. So the, the, on one level, this applies to very everyday objects. So you can think about knots, you know, if you if you sort of pass um, uh, a loop of string, string. Through, through, uh, through itself, um, intertwine it to form a knot, um, the, the, the way the string is linked to the number of times it passes through a loop formed by itself, you can sort of count those crossings. Uh, and, and that would be a whole number, and you can use that to classify what the knot is like. Uh, and um, knots with different numbers of crossings can't be deformed into each other without cutting without cutting the string. Um, that would be a sort of one-dimensional application of topology. In, in, in two dimensions, you can classify surfaces. Um, so, for example, uh, this this uh, eel, the surface of this eel, uh, is equivalent to a torus, roughly speaking. Um, because it has one hole uh, at the mouth, another hole down its uh, bottom end somewhere. Uh, and so it's connected. It has a single sort of hole threading through its uh, body. Uh, and, and so you could, if you imagine that was made of plasticine, the eel, you could continuously squash and deform it and stretch it out. Very horrible process for the eel to turn it into the, the torus I've shown on the right. Uh, in that case, you, you, the, the topological number, the, the whole number that determines whether the object can be deformed into let's say the torus would be the number of holes in the surface so there'd be one in the middle of the torus and one uh, threading through the body of the eel that's probably true of most animals they're probably mostly uh, well uh, equivalent to a torus those with a digestive tract um, uh, but but uh, on a more abstract level you can classify solutions to wave equations using um, this formalism of topology uh, and the idea here is is more abstract but it's it's again to 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 consider uh, one branch of the dispersion relation. So I don't know, this could be the, in this case, we've drawn the uh, one a, a, a dispersion relation separated by a gap with a gap in between it. Uh, you could take one branch of it, the lower branch in this case, and, and you take the wave, the way I've drawn it as a ket, but that would be, let's say, the electric field or the um, displacement field, or depending what kind of wave you're talking about. And from that, you can compute um, something called the Berry connection, which is just the inner product of the wave with itself, but you take the, the gradient of the wave with respect to um, the wave vector k. Uh, and then if you integrate that, uh, the curl of that thing, the curl of a over all values of k and divide by two pi, you get a whole number. And that's called the churn number. And that, so that's associated with one of the branches of the dispersion relation, this thing. Um, and the whole point is, uh, this is the, the sort of basis of this topological wave physics, uh, is you classify a branch of the dispersion relation using this, this whole number. 
And then that tells you um, whether if you take um, two different materials, both with a common band gap, and you compute this number for, let's say, one of, one of the lower branch, the branch below the band gap, uh, you can plot that whole number in the two materials and find that it's different. So in this, in this diagram here, these two are supposed to be different. These, these two uh, lower bands have a different churn number. Then that tells you that when you try and deform one of the materials into the other one, something, uh, something bad has to happen on the way, the analog of having to close the hole in the torus if you were to try and deform it, let's say, into a sphere. Um, something bad has to happen along the way, and that bad thing or, or critical thing that happens along the way uh, is the closing of the band gap between the two bands. And that indicates that somewhere along the way, when you turn material one into material two, the band gap has to close, and therefore you're going to have a, um, an interface state in, trapped in between the two materials. That's the basic idea. And this has been applied, this was first sort of uh, understood by the condensed matter physicists. So uh, it goes back a lot further than this 2005 paper, but um, they, they understood that this, this topological invariant, this, this churn number, this cur the integral I just showed you on the previous page, they understood that this was important for um, edge states in the quantum Hall effect. Uh, so when you stuck a conductor in a magnetic field, but then they also found that it was, it was important for predicting interface states uh, in, in materials where there was no external magnetic field. And this gave birth to a whole field of topological, uh, what's known topological insulators. Um, but, but from this, uh, there's sort of two things stuck in here. It, it appears, you know, you've got quantum in this title and spin hall effect and topological order. It, it sort of, it makes it seem like it's a special quantum effect. But really quantum mechanics, a lot of quantum mechanics is, is really just wave physics. And so um, all of this formalism that was used for predicting interface states between different materials in condensed matter physics uh, was translated over to electromagnetic materials, um, uh, acoustic materials, and mechanical materials. So we have uh, just put uh, three different examples here. Um, so this is one of the, the sort of early papers uh, in this electromagnetic materials box. This is one of the early papers on um, electromagnetic materials where you could use topology to predict uh, interface states. Uh, and here it's shown uh, basically there's an interface here between do two different materials. Their churn number is different uh, by one. So there is one interface state, which means when you stick a source at that interface, it radiates into that one interface state, one meaning there's no, there's no counter propagating wave. So the wave can only go one way. And so you get these surprising things, you know, like the wave can be uh, guided around some um, very complicated interface. Uh, the same thing has been demonstrated in acoustics. Um, so for airborne acoustics, you have to do some tricks to, to make the wave. Um, uh, so, you, so you can treat the wave effectively as having a kind of spin, but you can, you can uh, do that. So we've demonstrated it with, with, with acoustic metamaterials. This is, this is one way they've 3D printed some structure uh, which supports these interface modes. As, uh, if you, hopefully you can see there's a sort of interface there between two different kinds of materials. Um, and, and also uh, in mechanics, they demonstrated it with simple gyroscopes. This is a, um, uh, this, this lower, lower panel shows um, uh, what, what amounts to a couple of gyroscopes and you excite one of them uh, and then these colors represent the phase of oscillation of the gyroscopes that are spinning and, and the wave is, is again guided around the interface, um, in this case with, with vacuum. Uh, the, the lower panel just shows a time series showing that many, the, the wave gets to go many, many times around, well, several times around, um, around the edge of this sample. So, so that's the basic idea. So you, um, uh, you can use topology to compute a whole number for a given uh, branch of a dispersion relation, uh, maybe several branches, depending on what you're doing. Um, and you can use that to predict what happens at an interface. Um, more recently, it's, it's been extended to non-hermission systems. So this is where now you're, you're not just um, controlling the stru a lossless structure, you're actually controlling um, the dissipation in the structure as well. Uh, and you can have similar uh, similar behavior in, in, in non-hermission systems, although the, the sort of um, the zoo of effect is not so, quite so clear here. But you can get interesting things. So, for, for example, you can see straight away that, uh, let's say, in a, in a, uh, a graded material, um, you could have uh, some interface states. So you'd have some waves stuck at the interface between two materials predicted using topology. 
uh, if you do something as simple as just stick an I in front of the materials, one of the material parameters, which is uh, supposedly what's indicated in this, uh, this diagram here on, with the left arrow, um, uh, what you can turn what was a, um, a bound mode into a radiating mode. And so you can sort of create um, uh, so some kind of lasers, if you like. Uh, similarly, in this, uh, this world of uh, using non-hermission, uh, looking at non-hermission um, systems and topology in these systems, uh, there's, there's been a connection between uh, just the ordinary surface plasmon um, and uh, this, these topological invariants. So, so trying to re-understand uh, the old interface states that people have known for a long time in terms of these, um, uh, these ideas and topology. In this particular paper here, it's used uh, the helicity operator and looked at, um, uh, used it to compute these, these topological invariants, two sides of a surface, and used that to predict the, the presence of surface plasmas. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. That's just what I, I wanted to show you, that there's some, some sort of more, more recent work in this field where people are looked at, looking at non-hermission stru uh, structures as well as hermission ones. Right, so that's the basic idea. That's 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 the sort of uh, the, the uh, aim of the game in this field. You try and use topology to classify um, uh, branches of a dispersion relation in the simplest case, um, and and use this uh, thing called the churn number. So I just wanted to to quickly um, tell you uh, what this churn number is all about uh, and where it came from. Uh, before then, showing you some connection between this and um, and crystal optics of the uh, the refractive, just the ordinary refractive index. So, so um, when when Gauss was uh, he he was sort of uh, one of the the founders of um, the topology of surfaces. Um, one way he discovered how to let's say classify the topology of of any given surface uh, by just uh, looking at so you imagine you imagine you're wandering all over the surface and you count the number of times that the surface normal here winds over the surface of a sphere so for, for any given little portion of the surface you can calculate the element of uh the element of, of surface normal that's swept out on the sphere it's just the cross product between the change in the surface normal with the two coordinates dotted with the normal uh, and then uh, integrate that over the whole surface. So you can then integrate that over the whole surface. Uh, so you, you just calculate the, the amount of so solid angle that you sweep out over when you go over the whole surface, divide by four pi, which would be what you've got on a sphere. Uh, and this, uh, this then tells you how many times your surface normal wraps over the surface of a sphere. Um, you can rewrite this quantity here that sat inside the uh, integrand uh, as one over the two principal radii of curvature to just as a few manipulations to find that. So one over the two, the radii of the two circles you could fit uh, to, to a local patch on the surface. And this, so, so you can do this for any surface. And, and this, this winding number is twi twice it is called the Euler characteristic. So any, any surface, any two dimensional surface can be characterized in terms of something called the Euler characteristic which as I've just shown on the previous slide is, is just one over two pi times the integral of the Gaussian curvature over the whole surface. Um, so, the, so for a sphere, this, this thing turns out to be two. It's twice, you wind once around the sphere. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's two if you double it. Um, for a torus, you wind no times out over the sphere and you can roughly see that as being uh, the outer portion of the torus winds once around the sphere and then the inner portion winds once in the opposite sense and kind of undoes it. Uh, and then as you add more holes, your Euler characteristic goes down and down and down. And so this is, this is the number that you can use to characterize uh, any, two, any closed two-dimensional surface. So this is the sort of uh, the, the beginnings of topology. Topology, the, the, the ideas of topology came, uh, came from this classification of surfaces. Now there's a second way to write down uh, the gauss bonnet theorem. So as I just showed it to you then, we worked in terms of the surface normal of the, of the surface that you're trying to classify. So you're just counting the number of times that the surface normal of any given surface winds around uh, a sphere, the number of times it covers a sphere. Uh, you could, but, but the surface normal, you can equally write in terms of the tangent vectors on the surface. So you can always write the surface normal as the cross product of two tangent vectors on the surface. Uh, 
And if you do that, uh, instead of working in terms of the surface normal, this winding number becomes this expression here, which is the, um, it's the difference in these two uh, dot products between uh, the, the derivatives of the, the tangent vectors on the surface. Now, uh, the interesting thing about this is if you define something you call A, uh, AI, and just define that as, let's say, E1 dotted with the derivative of E2, the second tangent vector with respect to the coordinate I on the surface, this winding number, the number of times you cover, cover the surface um, of the sphere can be written as the curl of, some, of this A. So the curl of a vector potential. And this is where the interesting thing about topology comes from and the link to the churn numbers. So this is what the sort of origin of the churn number. Um, it looks like this should be identically zero because we're integrating the curl of something over a closed surface. But there's this thing called the, the, the Stokes theorem, the Stokes' theorem, which says that if you integrate a curl over a surface, it equals the integral of the thing you're taking the curl of over the boundary. But there is no boundary of this surface because it's closed. So it looks like it should be identically zero. Now, the whole point is that it isn't identically zero simply because this A thing here becomes undefined at some points in the surface. What it's telling us is that unless n is zero, like it, for a torus, because a torus, the, the surface normal doesn't wind any times around uh, the sphere, in which case this integral is allowed to be zero, unless this n is zero, this winding number is zero, then this vector potential, like quantity, this A thing here, has to go wrong somewhere. And this is an instance of something called the hairy ball theorem or, or, um, or Poincare Hopf, if you, you like to be less rude. Um, and the point is that uh, there will be point, depending on the topology of the surface, depending on how the surface is arranged, there will be points on that surface where if you try and put a tangent vector field everywhere, you'll find it's just impossible to make it work at all points. Uh, so for example, if you try and do it on a sphere, there's always points where the tangent vector field goes wrong. So like if you try and use the, you know, the, um, the theta, uh, theta hat uh, unit vector on the surface of a sphere, you know that at the north and south poles, it goes wrong. And it looks like there's a, there's a little uh, source at the north and south poles. Uh, you can see this on, on, on animals when, when you try, if you try and comb their hair flat, you know, at the, no at the nose of a guinea pig, there is a, a kind of a source where the, the, the hair it, uh, radiates from that point. Similarly, if you try to try to look at the, uh, the azimuthal unit vector on, on the, let's say, in spherical polar coordinates, you know that it, it, it swirls around the top of the, of, the pole, of the sphere. So it goes wrong at the top. Uh, and you see, you see this in the crown on people's heads uh, where the hair swirls around. But, but if you take a torus where um, this winding number is zero, then you're allowed to, you can, you can comb the hair smoothly. Uh, and you can see this, uh, this is some sort of bobble, hair bobble, uh, but you can see this on a, on a torus, you can have a unit vector that is well-defined everywhere without going wrong at, at any points. So, um, so this churn number thing that we're using in, uh, to record, uh, to, to classify our, um, our uh, branches of a dispersion relation, what we do when, we, when we're, um, looking at the, uh, the churn numbers, we're doing exactly the same thing. So in this case, uh, uh, so in, in the case of the gauss bonnet theorem, then we're counting the number of times that a surface tangent vector goes wrong on the surface, the number of defects in it. Uh, in, in the case of, let's say, um, the modes uh, in, a, in a periodic crystal, so if you looked into some crystal, then, then you imagine that, let's say, let's say it's, um, you take your Brion zone of some periodic crystal. So it's the thing inside the, 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 uh, the red dashed line. Uh, and let's say you calculate all, all the different modes uh, inside the, the red dashed line. You can imagine that each one of those modes, um, you take any point. Uh, so for example, you could take the, the M point um, in the zone. Um, and then that would be th this, this dashed line because of the periodic boundary conditions, you can, you know, you can attach the 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 edges of it um, to itself and make the surface of a torus. And so you can you have a torus, and attached to each point is the wave, which you could write as psi. Uh, and from that wave, you can write uh, 
uh, you can do it. It's a very different kind of vector. It's not a tangent vector like you have in the gauss bonnet theorem. It's now just, if you like, you could think of it as an absolutely enormous vector filled with all of the values of the field at all points in the unit cell. Uh, that that vector, um, you you can you can still calculate some kind of vector potential, which is uh, that. If you notice, this is almost the same expression we wrote down for our tangent vector on the on the surface of a uh, an object um, for the gauss bonnet theorem. You, you can you can write down that vector, take its curl, and then what this the whole number you get out of integrating this over the whole surface, this topological invariant that you use to calculate the number of interface states, what this is doing is counting places in the Brion zone where this vector potential like quantity here, this A called the Berry connection, the number of places where that goes wrong. So what we're doing when we're, number of places where it's undefined. So what we're doing when we're looking at the, the um, counting the number of interface states between two materials is we're counting the number of places where this, this quantity here goes wrong. And that's where I want to go now. So what, if we're counting the number of, if what we're doing is counting the number of defects in the wave, we're somehow counting a defect in the wave in order to determine interface states between two different materials. What do the defects represent? What, what I mean, uh, okay, we've got this topological theory Fine, we're calculating the number of defects. What I've told you so far is, is, is nothing new. You can find it in the literature. Uh, but what I was telling you now is what, what, what are these defects? Uh, and to, 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 to give you an example, um, I want to uh, take my favorite example from, from waves, uh, from, from wave physics, which is in electromagnetism, which uh, maybe is not, not quite right for this audience, but, but hopefully you can bear with me. Uh, so, so let's take an electromagnetic material that's gyrotropic. And what I mean by that is, uh, if you take the permittivity, uh, let's say it's got the, the normal, it, so if it was just an isotropic material, it'll have some diagonals, which would um, be the same. Uh, the little parallel on here, by the way, is supposed to indicate that I'm considering a wave that's propagating in the XY plane. And this is the part of the permittivity uh, associated with the XY plane. So a gyrotropic material, it has this, this diagonal part to the permittivity, but you can, you, you add, you make it hermitian. So you add an off diagonal bit, um, oh, imaginary off diagonal part. And for this particular example, I'm also going to have a, a permeability. Uh, and I'm going to set that equal to the diagonal of the permittivity. So, so if, if, um, uh, if there was no gyrotropy, so that the alpha was zero for this material, then, um, then epsilon would equal mu, and the whole thing would be impedance match. There'd be um, it would be like this this um, subject of transformation optics if you um, come across that. Um, so so if if, um, if if there was no alpha, what the and you were to plot out what the wave vector looked like as a function of lambda, it would be it would just be a cone. So lambda is a refractive index. So what that would be saying is as you increase the refractive index, then the value of, of K would increase, the wave vector would increase inside the material. But, but if you add this gyrotropy, uh, what it does is, it, is it, um, it, makes the, it makes a gap. So that means there are some values of lambda for where, where there is no propagation, where, where, the, wave, um, where the wave cannot propagate. So this is this is like having uh, this is the analog of having um, a periodic material and opening a band gap. So in this case, I'm, this this is not frequency here, but rather the diagonal of the permittivity and also permeability. But but by it, it's analogous in the sense that what, there, there is no gap in propagation when when alpha is zero. So so the the thing is just two cones joined together, the dispersion relation. But when alpha is non-zero. That a gap opens up, and then there is a region where, uh, in in parameter space, where no propagation is allowed. Um, so you can see that. So this is the dispersion relation prop, uh, plotted at the bottom. So you can see that um, when alpha is bigger than lambda, then k squared is negative. So there is no propagation allowed. Right. So um, if you calculate the the Berry connection for this particular kind of material, so um, classifying. This, this lower band here, I'm using exactly what I said before, 
to classify that lower band in terms of this topological invariant, this churn number. So if you do that, you find that this is the um, this is the form of the the Berry connection. This thing, this thing that we have to take the curl of, and then integrate it over all the values of k. Uh, now there's a slight a slight niggle here in that um, this k this this k here this wave number it actually extends to infinity, and so um, it's you've got to you know in order for any of this theory to work, I need I need to to wrap my a this vector that counts the number of times the wave goes wrong, I have to wrap it onto a closed surface. Uh, and so the way I'll do that is, is a trick that um, uh, several people have done it, but I, I know it from papers by Mario Silverina, uh, where you, you can uh, you do the stereographic projection. So you take all the values of your wave vector and then use the stereographic projection to project it onto a sphere. And uh, if you do that, then, then you find that as a function of theta on the sphere, uh, this is the Berry connection. So this is the um, the thing that we that we want to integrate over the sphere, and when we want to count the number of defects, and then those that number of defects will tell us about the interface states that can exist at the, at the interface of this material. Um, so if you do that, you can see that there is one defect. I've turned the sphere upside down so we can see it, and it's at the south pole. So the vector potential, if you go to the south pole, that's theta is pi, the cot goes to one, so the the a just becomes uh, this, uh, this circulating uh, azimuthal vector on the sphere. And so if you calculate the churn number for this, uh, for this uh, material, you find it's just the sine of alpha, minus the sine of alpha. Uh, so so uh, this tells us that if I put two materials together, uh, one with a positive alpha value of alpha, so positive gyrotropy, and one with negative gyrotropy, so two different electromagnetic materials, then um, that I would expect two interface states because there'll be a churn number of one for one of them and minus one for the other. But the interesting thing I want to point out is that the defect, the point where the wave goes wrong, is at k equals zero. It's at, uh, and you can see it in the dispersion relation as well, it's here. This is the point at which the wave goes wrong. It's at the point where the, the magnitude of the wave vector vanishes. So in an old in old parlance, that's that's the point where the refractive index has gone to zero. So the um, the churn number seems to be counting points where the refractive index goes to zero. So that's what I uh, want to get to in a second. So it's just to show you, this is uh, just a, a little simulation just to show you that it works. Um, the number of interface states between these two materials with opposite signs of the gyrotropy um, is two, uh, because the one's got churn number of one, the other's got a churn number of minus one. Uh, and if you stick a source uh, at the interface of these two materials that I've done in the simulation, sure enough, you get uh, a wave that gets stuck at the interface. And if you look very carefully, uh, the sort of cross section of the wave, you can see there's a kind of, it's not plain a wave fronts, the, the, the wave's sort of wiggling around. And you can decompose that wave into an even and odd part. So there's, um, and they're, they're two different modes. So there are indeed two different interface states that exist at this, the interface between these two materials, which we've calculated using our churn number, our topological invariant. But like I said, I want to connect this to the idea of the refractive index because it looks like the, at the point where the refractive index goes to zero, that's the point at which, uh, which the churn number is counting. That, that's the point that matters. Uh, so what's actually going on there at this point in terms of ordinary crystal optics? So now I want to go and look at the, the theory of how we, how we understand how a wave is propagating in an anisotropic uh, crystal. Uh, so, so in three dimensions, we'd use you know, the refractive index ellipsoid, but um, and let's let's sort of explain that in 2D. Um, so what you imagine is that you pick an angle, a direction of propagation. So that's a K hat. And then for that given direction of propagation, there's a refractive index N, which is the ratio of, of the magnitude of K and the free space wave number K naught. So, so through um, defining this, this form of the wave vector, you can trace out different shapes um, as a function of propagation angle, which mean that as you as you change the angle of propagation in some anisotropic material, the um, the, the magnitude of the wave vector changes. Um, and so, uh, in an isotropic material, this this uh, surface that 
the uh, wave uh, vector uh, traces out. It's just a circle. As you know, the dispersion relation in an isotropic material is just a dispersion surface is just a circle. Whereas in an anisotropic material, it, it can become some other shape, like the ellipse shown here. Uh, now, in, in two dimensions, uh, if I take uh, Tm polarization, you can write out the, the refractive index as a function of angle exactly. So this is the refractive index, uh, especially for the refractive index. And I've written it in terms of the two eigenvalues, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, and the two eigenvectors, E1 and E2, of the permittivity tensor. Um, and in general, these E1s and E2s can be complex because this thing to be lost is, just has to be Hermitian, doesn't have to be real. Uh, but these epsilon 1s and epsilon 2s, the eigenvalues have to be real. Uh, now let's look at this a little bit. Um, now the point I want to make is that there are different ways to get zero index. So I said this, this it seems that the churn number is calculating some, is counting something about when the refractive index goes to zero. But th this could be rubbish, but let's let's go with it for the time being and see, see if it gets us anywhere. Um, now, there are different ways for the refractive index to go to zero. Now, in this top left one that I've shown here, that is when both the two eigenvalues of the permittivity, I've just done this for a special case here, but there is that you can write this in general for all electromagnetic materials, just, to, just in case you were concerned. If both of these go to zero, epsilon one and epsilon two, then you can see that this n of theta will just go to zero. So, so if, you, if you make these two, two eigenvalues of the permittivity approach zero, then your dispersion surface just closes to a point. So you know the, the wavelength stretches and stretches and stretches, the wave number gets bigger and bigger, uh, uh, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and, um, and, and so the dispersion surface closes to a point. If, uh, and th this is for real values of E1 and E2. So the, the, the eigenvectors here are both real. So one could be along the x-axis, one along the y-axis. If you keep these eigenvectors real and just let one of the eigenvalues go to zero, then what happens is instead of closing to a point, the dispersion surface closes to a line. So it becomes more and more elliptical and eventually closes uh, just to a line. Uh, and then if you keep going, you can it becomes a hyperbolic material and this line breaks open into uh, into uh, an open surface. But there's another case uh, which we don't usually talk about. And that's if, if these, these um, eigenvectors, E1 and E2, these things here, if they're complex vectors, so they point in some complex direction, and you, you let one of the eigenvalues go to zero, so let's say you just let E1 go, epsilon 1 go to zero, not epsilon 2, then, then in that case, the refractive index is becoming zero in, a, in, a, in just one direction, not in both directions, like in this top left picture, but that direction is complex. And if you plot out what the, what the refractive index, uh, what the dispersion surface does, it does exactly the same thing, uh, uh, albeit it might have a slightly different shape, but a very similar thing, uh, as if you make just both of the eigenvalues um, go to zero. So it closes to a point. The dispersion surface closes to a point when, when the eigenvectors are complex. Um, and if you look at uh, that gyrotropic material I just showed you before, where there was uh, where we counted the number of interface states using the churn number, uh, then that is uh, exactly what we have. So if you decompose it into its eigenvectors and eigenvalues, the eigenvectors are indeed along complex directions, and if you remember, the two points where the wave vector vanishes vanished, which was where the churn number, these defects the churn number recorded, were where lambda squared equals alpha squared. So they were where one, one or the other of these two eigenvalues went to zero. So what the churn number is recording is it's recording one of these points where the refractive index has gone to zero, but in a complex direction. So it's not like ordinary refractive index going to zero, where both of the eigenvalues go to zero and the whole of epsilon vanishes. It's just one part of epsilon vanishing just for one complex direction. And, and we can understand what this means physically uh, through thinking about uh, what this does to the wave. So for example, if I, if I let this 
this propagation direction of the wave be such that its dot product between uh, one of the eigenvalues crossed with Z is one, but with the other direction it's zero, then this refractive index just reduces to the eigenvalue, the square root of the eigenvalue epsilon one. When that's zero, that, so just one of the two eigenvalues is zero, that means that the gradient of the field, in this case, for this polarization, the gradient of the out of plane magnetic field is zero along this direction when that eigenvalue goes to zero, which means that the wave gets stretched out along this axis here. Um, and so if you do that, let's say in COMSOL, you see that the wave gets stretched out along, uh, sorry, it doesn't show up very well, uh, along the axis you've chosen by letting one of the eigenvalues go to zero. If alternatively, this is for a real eigenvector, if alternatively it's a, it's a complex eigenvector, it doesn't mean the same thing at all. It doesn't stretch it out to uniformity along a given axis. It picks out a direction of circulation. So if I take, for example, uh, this, uh, it's like analogous to a circular polarization. So it picks out a direction of circular, 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 circularization. Um, so if I take uh, just, uh, let's say, this vector here, this um, rotating um, vector and make the refractive index zero in that direction, what that entails in terms of the field is that the, the outer plane field obeys this condition. It's not, it's not got a zero, der, zero derivative along some given axis in real space. It now obeys this condition here, which relates its, its real and imaginary parts of the field. And if you know some complex analysis, you'll, you'll recognize that these are the Cauchy-Riemann conditions. So when the, when the refractive index is zero in a complex direction, the field obeys the Cauchy-Riemann conditions, and then it only circulates in one sense. So uh, I've given a comparison here to show what a random superposition of plane waves looks like. You get these points, uh, uh, points where the wave vanishes, and, and the phase can circulate in either sense around these points. But um, when, when the refractive index is zero in, in this complex direction, all the nodes in the wave always have the wave circulating in the same direction. So it enforces a direction of circulation, uh, which is the origin of the one-way propagation uh, that you see when you put two different materials together. The one-way propagation of the wave at the interface, like we saw, let's say, in the gyrotropic material, uh, this dish is, is ind indicative of its onset, if you like, as you enter the band gap. So as you enter the band gap, the wave starts to circulate in just one way. Uh, and this is, uh, this is what the churn number is, is picking up. Uh, right, so now I've shown you this, I wanna just finish by showing you how you can use this. So I think you can understand what the churn number is recording, at least in, in many cases, many cases I've looked at in terms of this idea that the wave is, is, is becoming uh, an analytic function. And, and you can interpret that as having a refractive index of zero, but uh, for a complex value of the direction. Um, I want to show you that you can use this to, um, to shortcut to some uh, predictions of one-way interface states without ever having to compute anything topolo topological at all. So let's take uh, elasticity uh, as, as our first example. So let's, um, so in general, in an elastic material, then we've got this relationship between um, uh, the, the stress and the, the strain in terms of the stiffness matrix and the, um, so the derivatives of the displacement uh, and the stress tensor. Um, I can invert this and, and put the, the, C, the C matrix on the other side. And let's just consider a mode where, which only, so this is the analog of my um, TM mode that I was doing in electromagnetism. Let's consider just, just a wave where the displacement uh, is purely along the z-axis. Uh, then that will pick out one component, one part of this inverse stiffness tensor. Um, and it, and it, this, this will be related to the derivative of uh, the, the out-of-plane displacement of the elastic material uh, in a given direction. So the derivative of it uh, in the i-th direction. Now, instead of doing any topology or anything, all I want to do um, is just say, well, okay, I now have the derivative of the field in a given direction. I want to try and make a mode that just propagates uh, in one sense, so just circulates one way, um, 
and then I can, let's say, butt two materials up, one where it circulates clockwise, one where it circulates anticlockwise, and thereby make a material where there is a one-way interface state. I want to do that just by demanding that the refractive index is zero in a complex direction. And well, what that really means is that the derivative of the field is zero in a complex direction. So I'll just dot the left of this equation here with the direction I want the, the refractive index to be zero in. So I just dot it with a unit vector E, and then that just um, is contracted with the inverse stiffness tensor and the stress tensor and all the rest. Um, now, if I pick that E to be that complex direction I talked about before, so just X plus I, Y, then the, 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 the components of the stiffness tensor you require turn out to be just this. So you, you, what you've got is that it turns out to be uh, exactly the same form that we had for our gyrotropic material. It's just a, a diagonal um, lambda and then off di complex off diagonal. So this is some sort of um, time irreversible elastic material uh, with some complex off diagonals um, related to this number alpha. And this stiffness tensor diverges when lambda equals alpha. So this is our zero index point, exactly as you'd expect for a zero refractive index in elasticity. And what this material represents is so that normally if you had a had a elastic wave propagated along the x-axis, say, you'd have um, a stress, sigma one, three, that would be associated with it. But what we're adding to it is additional time delayed stress that is sigma two, three. And so we've got this kind of um, stress in plane stress that circulates as the wave um, propagates through the material. And if you work out what the wave equation is for this, this, oh, I didn't know what the wave equation is going to be. All I did was just uh, just use this condition, the same condition I want. I had an electromagnetism. and work out what the wave equation is for this mode. You find it's exactly the same wave equation as for the gyrotropic, uh, electromagnetic wave in the gyrotropic material. And so you find that it's exactly, so you can do the simulation exactly the same, just swapping the symbols. So uh, you, you have these two materials with opposite side gyrotropy, and now you can predict that there's a one-way interface state between them. Um, without ever having to have done any topology. You just, you just simply have to look at where the refractive index is zero. Uh, okay, let's do a, uh, another example. I'm gonna run out of five minutes or so. Um, as, as, as another simple example, uh, you, can, you can consider any homogeneous material uh, as having a point of zero refractive index. And this may sound like a, a, one of these zero refractive indices in a complex direction. So one of these points where the, the wave uh, is forced to circulate in just one sense. Uh, and the, 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 the trick, and, and I promise this is slightly more than a trick, uh, is, is just to consider, consider a, a homogeneous material where the, okay, I've chosen vacuum here, so the wave that number is K naught, but just consider a fixed propagation constant KZ out of the plane of the material. So here I'm imagining I've got a source and, and, and so there's a current or, or a, um, you know, a, a piezoelectric forcing or something on an elastic material, but the, the phase of that current is, is varying uh, along the source. So that I'm fixing the propagation uh, wave number Kz uh, to be a fixed value. And then I'm considering what the wave does in the plane. And this has exactly the same form of dispersion relation as we saw in the gyrotropic material. It's, it's again, uh, got a gap between the two because, uh, you know, K naught, if K naught can't be less than KZ in the plane. Um, so uh, if that was true, you know, the, the waves wouldn't be allowed to propagate in the plane. Um, so there is a gap uh, in, the, um, in the dispersion relation. And uh, actually, if you look at the zero index points, the point where the K vanishes, and I'll just, I'll just sort of sketch how this works. Uh, consider the, the out of plane field H. Uh, and if you were to, to calculate the curl of H, there'd be two parts. There'd be a part corresponding to its gradient in the plane. And then there'd be a part uh, which would be the gradient uh, out of the planes, so the, the derivative along the propagation direction. And that would be minus I omega uh, epsilon naught uh, E. Uh, in the plane. This here, this term here, you can take over to the left, sorry, over to the right from the left, and you can consider it as, as, a, as a material parameter and then stick it into your um, crystal optics, just as you normally would, as if it was a, a, a material parameter. And you find that actually that 
the whole system is equivalent to having a, an effective epsilon, this is just effective, of ones on the diagonals and then i kz over k naught and minus i kz over k naught um, on the off diagonal. So it looks exactly like a gyrotropic material and exactly like the funny elastic material we showed before. And so at the point where kz equals k naught, so this point here at the bottom of the dispersion relation, the wave behaves as if it's in uh, a zero refractive index material, material where the, 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 the direction of propagation is uh, complex and, and so it's forced to circulate one way. I should say that um, I also haven't mentioned that you have to choose the polarization basis uh, E out of plane plus or minus I H out of plane. So you have to choose a sort of circularly polarized basis for this to be true. Uh, and sure enough, if you do a simulation, you can see that this, this indeed works. So I've, uh, here is my source, the, the outer plane source is pointing out with a page. And I plotted the different components of the field. So the outer plane E, the outer plane H, and then these two combinations that I told you about, E plus IH and E minus IH. And as you increase the propagation uh, constant out of the plane, you see that uh, in this basis here, where the wave, where you're talking about the two circularly polarized, if you like, uh, components of the field, you get a one-way interface state. So you get a wave, this, I put a metal here, by the way, this, 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 is, this is essentially a surface plasma seen in, the, in some particular basis. Uh, as you approach this zero index point, then the wave starts to just propagate uh, in one direction. And this is, this is an example of uh, the spin momentum locking phenomenon that people have talked about. And uh, anyway, yes, you can, uh, you can read about it. Um, I should quickly, just to finish, just um, talk just in the last few minutes. Um, how does this relate to periodic materials? Because at the moment we've just done continu continuous media. Uh, I want to show you that, that this is also for the, um, this is also true for the periodic media where you, you typically compute this, this churn number thing. So, so if you take a honeycomb lattice and a wave in a honeycomb lattice, then um, you, if you've studied this, you might know that uh, close, to, close to the corners of the, the Brion zone, uh, then you can adopt a, a picture where you just consider two bands of propagation and the wave uh, obeys something that looks like the Dirac equation, which is this thing here. So this, this being the amplitudes of the the wave in the two different uh, bands, the upper and the lower band of the periodic material. Now you can see that when, um, when I choose my energy, so that would be my frequency equal to M, and that's when you're exactly at the bottom, or alternatively, if you choose the other one, uh, the top of, of one of uh, these two bands that are, that are about to meet, you know, you have two bands about to meet at this point, you're either here or here, then the wave obeys the, this derivative of the component being zero. So it becomes, again, an analytic function of position uh, or equivalently, you can think of this as being like a material where the refractive index is zero in a complex direction. It obeys exactly the same uh, equation in the periodic material. Uh, and just to finish, just to show you that it gives you more than just interface states. So if you consider these materials and you look at how, uh, how sources uh, radiate when they're in those, one of these funny materials where the refractive index is zero, but in a complex direction, uh, then you find you can get uh, highly... Uh, circulation dependent emission. So for one sense of circulation of the source, you get almost no emission like here. And for the other sense of circulation, you get lots of emission. Uh, this is just a, a source that's rotating embedded in, a, in, in this funny zero index material. And similarly, if you, if you scatter from one of these materials, you find that uh, for one, one handedness of waves, so one sense of circulation of the wave, this is what this shows here, then it scatters exactly as if it was from a mirror. So the red dots uh, indicate, the, sorry, the blue crosses indicate the reflection coefficients for each partial wave uh, if it was just a mirror, like a PEC. So for one sense of circulation of the wave, the, the partial waves, it scatters as if it's a PEC, they're not allowed inside. Uh, and for the, for the other sense of circulation, it, it is allowed inside and scatters differently. Uh, so this, th this funny material here is just another, just another random choice I made just for one of these materials, in this case, it's by and isotropic in electromagnetism, but one of these materials which have a refractive index of zero in a complex direction. So to finish up then, um, these are the points I really wanted to get across. Uh, the churn number, it records the points uh, where the, if you like, the solution to the wave equation goes wrong as a function of the wave vector in some branch of the dispersion relation. And in many cases I've looked at, um, well, all the cases I've looked at, it, these can be thought of as points like 
where a sort of effective refractive index vanishes. But it's an unusual kind of vanishing refractive index because it's not, it's not like an isotropic material. It's, it's like a refractive index vanishing, in, but in a complex direction, if you examine it using um, crystal optics. And that complex direction indicates that the wave is only allowed to circulate in one direction. So either clockwise or anti-clockwise. And this allows you to, this gives you a kind of shortcut. So um, through demanding that refractive index vanish in one of these in a complex direction, you can get many of the results you would have got using topology, but, but more quickly. Uh, and you're not bound by assumptions like the, the, way, the, the material has to be lossless or anything. And, and you, maybe you can find things beyond interface states. Um, anyway, I just finished by thanking uh, the students I work with um, who are always very helpful. It's good to discuss with them. Uh, that's everything. Okay, uh, thank you, Simon, for this uh, absolutely excellent uh, talk. Um, uh, very well explained, but uh, still uh, is not a uh, um, trivial uh, subject and uh, topic. So um, I think we should have uh, some more questions. Uh, so please, guys, can just unmute yourself and uh, ask Simon any, any question related to his talk. <laughs>